for me, I didn't know what I was doing, but I, I thought like, well, it doesn't matter I don't, if, if I know or, or don't know what I'm doing. As long as I'm not hurting somebody else, as long as I'm not taking somebody's wealth or value and destroying that, if I'm only adding value, um, then then I can I can just let the ball roll. And as long as the ball just stays like that, then, you know, and I'm not destroying anything on my path, then for me, like, like let's see what it can be. Honestly, for the first time in a long time, I don't know. But like, if you can accept the failures and know if they're learning processes, then for me, like, that's what it's all about. Everybody is always in the process of rebuilding. The key to winning this game is staying in the game. Welcome back to The Rebuild. These are the Founder Deep Dive Sessions, where we have a lot more time to focus on the single founder and get to know their business, how they think, and how they're approaching this whole rebuild process. My name is Brian, and I'm so grateful that you're back to join us for this Founder Deep Dive Session. Today, we're gonna to look at Rose's interview. What most people didn't see in that full episode was how much he actually cares about people too. This duality is actually kind of unique, and I think a lot of founders struggle with this, finding the right balance between uh, focusing on people and focusing on profitability because they feel somehow that profitability trumps people or that being nice comes at a detriment to the business. So I'm glad we have time now to understand how Roe approaches this aspect of startup life and especially in the context of this whole rebuild. So stay tuned until the end to hear how he answers a special bonus question and make sure you subscribe to catch the next Founder Deep Dive session as well as the next episode of the rebuild. Thank you so much and let's see what Roe has to say. And uh, yeah. you've been on an insane journey. Uh, you've pivoted a lot. <laughs> I think you've, you're not, you know, when you first started, you were talking about suits and now you're starting to talk about technology or you've been talking about yeah. it the entire time, but all I saw was the suits. So now you yeah, bring this, so. all this integrated together. You've expanded uh, the supply chain. You brought it over to Europe now. And uh, your business is interesting because you have things that are in China and also uh, parts that are in Europe or expanding over there too. Yeah. So, yeah. Want to tell the rest of the world a little bit about yourself and uh, Rick, so um, yeah, we can get into the, probably the products later, but yeah, you're right. Like on the outset, most people just see um, like us as a suit and company, um, and so it was very hard to know what we're doing behind the scenes. Uh, but hopefully, go learn a bit today about it. So yeah, I'm from Ireland. If you can't already hear from my voice, and um, so love the voice. What we <laughs> yeah, what we started doing initially was. Um, we were, we were producing suits. So we started off basically, it was me kind of going door to door in uh, the French Congestion, which is an area in Shanghai. And it was just um, selling suits. I was off the back of uh, like a finance corporate job. And I just, I just hadn't, I just didn't want to get into kind of the whole corporatocracy of, of the Fortune 500 companies. So um, yeah, I just went door to door in the beginning. I just thought, you know, there was maybe a bit of a gap in the market. And um, I felt like I could bridge the gap, every entrepreneur's uh, naivety, right? And then, um, and in the beginning, it just it just snowballed. Um, I was just given a great service. Uh, it was a great price at the time, but the product was completely different. And it kind of built from there. And my kind of one rule, like I didn't know anything about anything. Like I didn't have any knowledge on startups whatsoever. Like I was super naive. And um, but I had one rule, and it was just as long as I didn't destroy the wealth of somebody else, then I could build as I want. So there, I didn't have any rules. I didn't have any business plans. I didn't have anything. I was. Yeah, so now I'm getting, curious about that last part. You were just saying that you were, you had this one rule, which is never to destroy the wealth of another person. Yeah. Okay. Before branding ever came in or mission, vision, value, all of these MVP stuff, like before any of that, besides me not knowing that, but before any of that kicked in, I needed like a, some sort of like a path. And for me, I didn't know what I was doing, but I, I thought like, well, it doesn't matter I don't it, if I know or, or don't know what I'm doing. As long as I'm not hurting somebody else, as long as I'm not taking somebody's wealth or value and destroying that, if I'm only adding value, um, then then I can I can just let the ball roll. And as long as the ball just stays like that, then you know, and I'm not destroying anything on my path. And for me, like like let's see what it can be. That's amazing because I mean, so, uh, I've known you for for so long now, actually uh, many years I think, and uh, and I didn't know. I mean, I could sense. You had this guiding principle, but we never talked about that explicitly. And I think that's just really cool that we get to start off with just this little nugget there. That's amazing. Man. Yeah. And so, wait, yeah. when was well, that? When did you actually start the business? And uh, Yeah, that was, uh, must have been about 2015 because we're oh, five years old now. So. That's impressive, man. Yeah. Wow. No, I mean, uh, you know, you always uh, present yourself as a scrappy guy and I know you built the business to a, a pretty uh, decent level. I've been very impressed and admire what you've done. 
I didn't know you, it, it took five years. I mean, I, it makes sense because you built so much and you've worked so hard. And uh, yeah, that's five incredible. years, man. I don't know. I don't know, man. Like I'd expect to be maybe, I don't know, but that's just inherent in me. I'm never happy, but um, I don't know, man, five years. Like I definitely expected maybe some other things to happen, you know, but um, like I did expect us to expand at a quicker pace. I expected our, our, our kind of ready to wear to expand or mid to measure local brand to expand faster. But I also didn't understand the market fully either. So, and I, I want to just finish up what I said earlier on because that might have said all well and good to people who are listening. Uh, there's a dark side to that. So um, that's all well and good in the beginning, right? To fix the game that you win. You always want to fix the game that you win, right? But then like, if you always let that be your mindset where like just you can just go and do anything as long as you're not destroying other people's wealth, that becomes quite toxic if you don't have, um, again, the mission, vision, value that I told you earlier on, a business plan, a cash flow forecast. You don't hire a chief marketing officer. You don't, and we did do all of those stuff, but we definitely did them two years too late. So that's something I've never really shared with anybody, just never had the chance to. But like, I would be careful of that, that the convergence from like, yeah, like the startup phase, like, I don't know what it is, but I'm okay not knowing what it is. And it's like, let's say like that six months and call it whatever you want. And that's fine. And that's good. And be, be calm with yourself for that. But know when you reach like a convergence point when you're like, okay, we've got money in the bank. Now it's time to be serious about like, you know, where's our target audience? Okay. Who are we selling this product to? What is the brand direction? What is the product branded as? You know, what's the target niche in terms of pricing? Like, and how are we meeting them via like a channel medium? How are we selling and stuff? And I don't think we identified that soon enough. You know, we do now, but yes, hindsight's a beautiful tool, isn't it? So how's the tailoring connected to this in Europe? Like, give me a, a bigger picture overview. So um, we're a group and then underneath the group, we have a local consumer brand. Um, in Shanghai and uh, further far as well, uh, throughout Beijing and um, uh, Hangzhou too. And then in the separate side of the group, we also supply uh, B2B. So um, we supply other consumer consumer brands with the ability to offer mid-measure, which is a fancy word for tailoring, in-store as well. And you can use our software and our production because um, I set up a factory here. We own and run a factory here in Shanghai as well. So they can use like almost our hardware and our software and then we put it together and it kind of built from there. And I mean, you know, it's it's incredible. I mean, it really makes sense. Like what I was saying before, you have these five years of experience. Everything you just dropped right there. It shows all the all, a lot of your experience and knowledge that you've you know learned the hard way. And I think we talked about that many times over many coffees. Just yeah. learning the hard way. Um, yeah, I think not for basically everybody. We're about to learn a very very hard lesson. With that, like let's focus a little bit on the crisis. Uh, what happened? But what was it like during that time for you? So the impact of the crisis was that, so there's kind of like, a, it's kind of like a pendulum swing. So like you have it up here and it's kind of like Shanghai, 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 oh, and in Europe, right? So uh, like closures in Shanghai, lost all our sales in Shanghai, um, Ireland, UK, France, Norway, where we sell the most with our B2B vendors was okay. It was pulling in enough to pay for rent and pay for basic salaries and stuff, but we lost all our growth power. Um, and then like the pendulum like hit the like bottom where like Shanghai and China is still closed. Our stores were closed. We weren't really processing any sales. And then all of Europe, Europe shut down as well. So like we lost all our sales from all our vendors as well. So like pretty much, um, yeah, in February, just like zero, wow. absolute zero revenue, you know, and, uh, yeah, really tough. So, um, you can imagine how it is the bricks and mortar stores here closed, uh, the people we supply who also have bricks and mortars closed, and um, so even though like like positioned in China with a consumer brand and positioned on a, on a B2B market in Europe with, a, with our own brand there, um, it's a great hedge. But when something like a virus, a pandemic around the world comes, I mean, <laughs> I mean, everybody's a victim, right? So yeah, you um, throw every yeah. like, plan that you have out the window, nothing that you, you no one could really, really prepare for it. Right. Nobody could forecast uh -huh. anything like this. Yeah. Um, so, all right. That's been you said at the end of February. Now it's just the beginning of April. Uh, how's yeah. it been more recently then? You, you're all right? Yeah. Yeah. Shanghai's picking up now. We, uh, for March, we broke even. So I think a good thing to talk about, right, is, um, is uh, like mindset, right? So I know it's something you're very good at as well. Like, and you've been great helping me over these years with my great healthy mindset as well. And I think like the mindset's really important. So like, yes, we were closed. Yes, our businesses in Europe were closed. So we, they were obviously weren't giving us orders. But honestly, like, I never really got down about it because like I knew we were always going to be solvent. I knew relatively clearly how we were going to pay bills. We have a ha we always had a healthy cash flow. I'm really big on cash. I think cash is king. 
and and I'm really big on not chopping salary as well. Like, and I think it was all over the mindset. So creating kind of um, features throughout the march that were like like really cool ways to earn money. So one thing we did was uh, we created like a, a credit card, a prepaid card, and we pre-sold the card to we sold the card to like all our customers. And it was a great way to get like revenue generated up front and then to kind of pay that back over time. So that's how we broke even in March. And then um, we also took a lot of the model suits from around the store and we just rapidly sold them. We just cleared out the whole store and we were just like, yeah, come on, screw it. Let's just sell all the socks. So we liquidated as much stock as we could. Uh, we gave it at a great price. So like a lot of people in Shanghai got great bargains. Um, um, and that was that was fine to do, you know. Like, and so we your the strategy there was just to to get cash flow in, or just continue to bring no pure cash flow, that, right? pure cash flow, yeah, pure cash flow. Like we had we had cash on hand, but for me, like I'm just I don't I don't think it's healthy economics to just be like, oh yeah, just like I'm sitting here chill. I'll just let the cash deplete and like yeah, I'll just pay it out. Like yeah, okay, you could do that in a worst case scenario, but like if you have some sort of mechanisms that you can um, instigate quickly, then why not? And this was yeah. a great one. We we already had them. They were VIP gift cards. So we actually had a really nice design marketing product here that we could eat, like sign off on. Uh, SFQID, fantastic mm-hmm. system. That's mm-hmm. only in China. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Yeah. So we could even pop them out and to arrive that day. People could pay us on WeChat. So again, another great Chinese invention, you know, WeChat Pay. So people could even pay us. And like we people in California and we people in Dusseldorf who were stuck abroad and were planning on coming back and they could wire 10,000, 15,000, in one case, 20,000 RMB from, from, from abroad, you know? And, and that's that kind of connectivity that probably didn't exist before, you know, that allowed basically us to break even in March. Yeah, you know? so so, I, I think this great. is what I want to get to next is like, how does this challenge compare to the other challenges, right? Because I mean, obviously we're in a new situation. Everything is a lot more robust, you know, with the systems. And I think your business model is actually relatively robust. So uh, I'm curious to hear, you know, how was it? I mean, I mean, Oh, hard to say robust, Brian. Like I used to think that too. And now look, we've literally been decimated, like got it alive, you know. So you can be as robust in the sense of like your market, I think. Like we're very robust in the retail industry, but like when all the stores have to shut, like um so we used a month to launch a ready to wear brand for Scandinavian market. So that was something like I've been thinking about for three years. And for me it's like the kind of level three of three levels in the game, you know, of kind of perfect hedge. And I'm always chasing the perfect hedge. And I think like if I can supply on the consumer level in China, supply on the wholesale level in Europe and supply on the consumer level globally, I mean, that's a long way to diversifying your portfolio, right? So, um, so that was something that came true that kind of, I was hoping for a lot, uh, a long time. And, um, Camilla, one of our partners really helped me achieve that as well. A lot of it is to do with brand and marketing. So, so that was really great, uh, because ready to wear, it's just such a huge industry and it's rife for disruption. And we're going to do it a little bit differently. If you are to rebuild from now, like, like what would you, what would you dream of building? Like if I was to start another business, I think like after everything I've gone through with shareholders and raising money and, you know, um, some of the events we've had and, and just kind of the general way people talk about, you know, earning money and, pro- and deriving profits kind of made me uh, lose a little bit of faith in this whole concept of uh, startups for money. So like, I think I would definitely do a social, social enterprise for sure. Like I would love to see a product or service that I created with my team that's actually directly helping someone have a better life. Right. And I don't mean a better life tomorrow. I don't mean a better life in 10 years time. I mean a better life right now. You download the app, you, you just receive the product and immediately your life is better straight away. You know, like, and especially in countries where, you know, and maybe access to capital or access to knowledge is a little bit depleted, you know? Right. So um, that would be great. Like, for example, if anyone's interested, like there's a great company online that, that I love and um, uh, their uh, bloodline, so it's actually an originally, Cali- originally Californian company, but their uh, biggest market is in Rwanda and they fly on um, autonomous, autonomous drones. So they launch the drone off a big back of an elastic band into the air yeah. and uh, they fly yeah. blood, packs of blood to uh, people in different local Rwandans in different hospitals who need like blood transfusions very quickly, which is a, very, a big, big problem in Rwanda because a lot of the roads are uh, disconnected and, and they're muddy and they slide, right? And uh, unbelievable, just unbelievable. The amount, the, the effects that they can say they have on people's lives in Rwanda, like it's just, I just think it's unbelievable. I think like whoever did that just makes me so proud of themselves, you know. And that's worth, that's a business worth having no salary over 
or raising money and killing yourself with investors and flying back and forth. That, that's worth it, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's really beautiful, man. You know, I, I'm all, yeah. like I said, we were talking yesterday and I was just thinking like, really, there's got to be more. There's, we've got to be doing something different. Right? Yeah. We've got to be contributing somehow. And I, I don't know, it's really, this, this whole thing is affecting me in a, in a way that I didn't expect it to. And uh, yeah. I think it's, it's forcing everybody to rethink. But uh, all right, last question. Um, in, in a month's time, roughly, what do you think, what, what are you going to be focusing on? What do you want to uh, look forward to? Or what do you want us to yeah. like? It has to be profitability, yeah. like number one. Return yeah, to profitability. To yeah, return to profitability because especially um, aside from the obvious benefit that, you know, every company needs to be profitable. I feel like that's something lost in 2020 with the Ubers of the world, right? But um, yeah, profitability, man, profitability, right? So you've got yeah. profitability here. And then I would say like we've got five warm leads at the end of our funnel for the B2B company. So I'd love to close them leads out. And I'm talking with those businesses a lot. Now they're mostly in Ireland, UK. They're going through it and I'm helping them get through the process. And I think I'm building a really nice level of trust with them. So like each one of those contracts will be worth like uh, worth with a lot of money and uh, five of them would be great. And then yeah, launch their ready to wear brand. I'd like by in a month's time, we would be either launched fully or we would be on the fringes of doing that. So it's all just to be about clicking the button. That's amazing. That would be nice. I'd be happy enough with that. I mean, every time I talk to you, I'm like, man, this guy's so ambitious. But, you know, every time you also surprise me. So I'm looking forward to hearing what's happening next. Yeah. But honestly, man, like that's the, like most of the times, like you're going to fail. Like, so, but I'd rather, I'd rather like try to go to Jupiter and maybe, maybe like crash land on Mars, you know, <laughs> like, in, like I'd rather go for a hundred and get 80 rather than go for 80 and get 60, you know? So, right, right. and like you do, you set it up where you fail most of the time. But like, if you can accept the failures and know their learning processes, then for me, like, that's what it's all about. Oh my God. That's amazing. And I think most people, you know, same, especially bro. for the people who are going through or rebuilding, whatever they're rebuilding. Right. I, I think that's a great mindset to have just a, a perspective on, on what you're trying to do. If you're going to do it, do it right. And really, really like set yeah. a high, high ideal for yourself, high, set a really, really high standard. So that's yeah. an amazing point. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Oh, well, uh, you're the same, bro. You're the same, bro. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, go, good luck. Get back to it. I know you got a really, really busy yeah. day, so talk to you soon, okay? Almost signing time. I don't know. All of us are going to take these different tags on how to rebuild our businesses, ourselves, society, and all that kind of stuff. That's what I'm thinking about. But like, if you can accept the failures and know their learning processes, then for me, like, that's what it's all about. Key to winning this game is staying here. Everybody is always in the process of rebuilding. Like, all right, let's wrap this up.